Hello, and welcome to the battlefield of Cold Harbor. I'm Ranger Mark, along with Ranger Claire, and we're two of the historians for Richmond National Battlefield Park. We're standing outside of the visitor center here at Cold Harbor, in front of a large map that details the movements of both the Union and Confederate armies during the Overland Campaign of May 1864. That campaign was like every other in the American Civil War. It was bloody and brutal, and ultimately by the end of May 1864, it would bring the two armies back here to this place, Cold Harbor, just nine miles east of the Confederate capital city of Richmond. The Battle of Cold Harbor was not a one, two, or even three day battle, but nearly a two week affair. And it all began with a cavalry fight, a battle for control of the old Cold Harbor crossroads just one mile from where we're standing. The Overland Campaign would pit the Confederate commander Robert E. Lee against the new general in chief of all Union armies, Ulysses S. Grant, summoned from the West and now riding with the Army of the Potomac. This campaign would be the first time these two commanders meet in combat. But for their armies, they know each other quite well by this point. So let's set the scene. It's early May, 1864, and the Overland Campaign has begun. It's a campaign that will take these two armies through a month-long series of marches and maneuvers, constant contact with one another, constant combat as the Union Army continues to sidestep the Confederates on their southerly march towards Richmond. It's a campaign designed by the Union to wear down the Southern forces in hopes of ending the war there in the spring of 1864. Needless to say, expectations for success were very high in the North, and the freedom of four million enslaved people depended upon the outcome. But May 1864 was grueling and bloody, and the Overland Campaign would wear down not only the Southern soldiers in the Army of Northern Virginia, but also the Union soldiers in the Army of the Potomac. Casualties were high on both sides. The Union Army would suffer upwards of 40,000 casualties, but finding replacements for those troops would be a much easier task for Ulysses Simpson Grant in his new role as General in Chief of all United States Armies. He looks to the South, to the Army of the James, commanded by the Massachusetts politician Benjamin Butler. Ever since their defeat at Second Jury's Bluff in mid-May, the Army of the James had basically been idle bottled up at Bermuda 100 just off the James River and by a smaller Confederate force commanded by General P.G.T. Beauregard. But Grant selects from this army the 18th Corps, commanded by General William F. Smith, known as Baldy in the army. Old Baldy Smith had impressed Grant greatly the year before out in Tennessee, and soon he and the soldiers of his 18th Corps would be making their way down the James River towards the Union supply base at White House Landing on the Pamunkey. Likewise, the Confederates suffered grievous casualties, around 25,000, and for one of the last times in the war, perhaps the last time, Robert E. Lee would be able to more or less replace those losses. But Lee does not command all Confederate forces, at least not yet. At this point, he commands only one army, so he basically has to beg, borrow, or steal to get the reinforcements he needs. He's finally able to get approval not for an entire corps, but for one division a division of troops commanded by Robert F. Hoke of Beauregard's command. Soon, Hoke will move his regiments to Chester Station, where they will board the trains and ride the rails to the north side of the James. By late May, his leading brigade of North Carolina troops, commanded by Thomas Klingman, were already on the way. They would disembark at Atlee Station a few miles north to begin their march to Cold Harbor. Klingman would halt his troops a couple miles short as they awaited the arrival of the rest of their division. By late May, the armies found themselves locked in a stalemate along the Tottapotomoy Creek, just about six miles to the north of Cold Harbor. To guard the roads leading to the supply base at White House and to keep the Confederates from using those roads to hinder the movements of the 18th Corps once it arrived and keep it from linking up with the Army of the Potomac, Federal Cavalry Commander Phil Sheridan moved his headquarters to the extreme left flank of the Union Army near the small village of Old Church. Shooting out south from Old Church, the Bottoms Bridge Road eventually links up with the Old Cold Harbor Road. That will travel to the west for about another five miles before coming back to the crossroads of Old Cold Harbor. That would constitute the extreme right flank of the Confederate Army. Baldy Smith's 18th Corps arrives at White House, and its arrival is big news, apparently in both armies, as Robert E. Lee was well aware of it. Lee believed that Grant intended to use the 18th Corps to spearhead a major assault against the Confederate right flank 
to crumple that flank up, push it aside, and then basically roll unopposed into Richmond. To combat that, Lee needed to move a large body of troops here to Cold Harbor. But that meant weakening his Totopotomy Creek lines. And he couldn't do that, not without additional information. So on May the 30th, Lee sent out a reconnaissance force, a brigade of South Carolina cavalry under the command of Brigadier General Matthew Butler. Butler's job was clear. Scout the Confederate right flank, find the Union Army. Neither army had intended to fight here at Cold Harbor. But as so often happens in war, things would escalate very quickly. I'm standing along the roadway that leads to the community of Old Church, about five miles from Cold Harbor. Behind me across the road is Emanuel Episcopal Church. It's a one-story red brick structure of the Gothic Revival style. The church building itself was erected back in 1853 to replace an older church structure that had stood on the spot during colonial times and pretty much gave the community its name. Old Church is a well-remembered name in Richmond's Civil War past. During his famous ride around the Union Army in June 1862, Confederate Cavalry Commander Jeb Stewart and his 1,200 troopers passed right by here along the road and routed the 5th U.S. Cavalry who were encamped there in the churchyard. Two years later, the Union Cavalry was back in the area and they were here in force. Occupying Old Church was a division of Federal Cavalry commanded by Senior Brigadier General Alfred Torbert. Torpet's command consisted of three brigades of cavalry, all being led by Generals Wesley Merritt, George Armstrong Custer, and Colonel Thomas C. Devon. On May the 30th, Devon's brigade was ordered south along the Bottoms Bridge Road. Known in the cavalry as Buford's hard hitter, Devon posted his brigade securely along the northern bank of Matadequan Creek, and then he sent one squadron from the 17th Pennsylvania across the creek and further south to continue the patrol. Less than a mile away, the squadron ran into trouble, bumping right up against Matthew Butler's Confederate Cavalry Brigade. That Confederate Brigade, consisting of the 4th and 5th South Carolina Cavalry, was 2,000 strong, and they would make quick and bloody work of the Pennsylvanians, pushing the smaller force all the way back to the creek. Devin sent in additional troops, but he realized he needed more help, so he sends back for support. General Torbert then makes the decision to commit the rest of his division to the fray, and just like that, the tables have turned. It's now the South Carolinians who find themselves outnumbered, outgunned, and beginning to take severe casualties before breaking off the action and falling back all the way to the crossroads of Old Cold Harbor. By the time they come back, Matthew Butler's command has been beaten, battered, and bloody. But they did the job they were asked to do. They came back with information. Federal cavalry was indeed here on the Confederate right flank, and they were here in strength. With fighting over at Old Church, Matthew Butler's South Carolina cavalry fell back to the southwest towards the Cold Harbor crossroads, with Federal cavalry close behind. Union General Torbert was under the impression that Confederate cavalry likewise was in the same area and had plans to attack. He made the decision to attack first, to draw first blood. In his words, an excellent opportunity to strike the enemy a severe blow. I'm standing near a white Virginia historic sign in a grassy farm field along what is known as Rock Hill Road, about half a mile from Cold Harbor. At this time in 1864, it was part of Cold Harbor Road. Heading west straight up this road was the lead brigade of General Wesley Merritt. Following in Merritt's wake rode the troopers of the Michigan Brigade, known as the Wolverines. They were commanded by the brash young Brigadier General George Armstrong Custer, one of the youngest generals in the Union Army, Custer's star was on the rise. A year later, he would be breveted a major general. Here at Cold Harbor on May 31st, he was leading his Wolverines into combat. As the Federal Cavalry got closer to the crossroads, Custer sent his 6th Michigan Regiment to the left, fanning out to link up with Union troops of Thomas Devon's brigade who were coming up from the south in order to form a solid wall of horsemen approaching the crossroads. Near this spot, Merritt's brigade slammed into Confederate cavalry picket. A brief firefight ensued with the Confederates retreating to the west, back towards Cold Harbor with the news that Federal Cavalry was quickly approaching. This is the crossroads of Old Cold Harbor, where five roads converge. It's still a pretty busy intersection. Bordering the intersection, to one side are wide open farm fields. On the other, it's bordered by residential communities and a small community store. I'm standing in the parking lot of that small store. 
By the time the Civil War broke out, this community was already considered an old one. As a matter of fact, 80 years before, back during the American Revolution in August 1781, American General Mad Anthony Wayne marched his 800 Pennsylvania Continental Troops right here through the crossroads on their way ultimately to Yorktown. Behind me, on the southeast corner of the intersection, in place of that now old dilapidated bungalow from the 1930s, once stood the namesake of this community, the Old Cold Harbor Tavern. It's a pretty odd name as there is no harbor anywhere around, not for miles, and it's rarely cold in this neck of the woods in May and June. The name stems from an old Germanic and English term for a type of tavern that took in travelers, provided them with a room, a safe haven or harbor, but did not serve their customers hot food, a cold harbor. Uh, it's not very well known in our country, but there's well over 100 references to this type of tavern in Great Britain. During the war years, the old Cold Harbor Tavern was owned and operated by Isaac and Sarah Burnett and several of their descendants still live in the Richmond, Virginia area today. With the news brought back to him by Matthew Butler, news regarding federal cavalry in the area, Robert E. Lee immediately dispatched a division of his own cavalry here to the crossroads, a division commanded by his own nephew, Fitzhugh Lee. By mid-morning of May the 31st, Fitz Lee's division has arrived. Two brigades of Virginia cavalry commanded by Generals Lunsford Lomax and Williams Wickham. To my right, is the old Cold Harbor Road. Just outside of the intersection, Lunsford Lomax dismounted his brigade and they began to throw up defenses. Basically, just fence rails and earth piled across the road as a roadblock. Over on the other side, on the Confederate right, Williams Wickham is doing the same thing with his brigade, dismounting uh, his troops along the southerly route, then known as Black Creek Church Road, putting those same types of defenses. In the afternoon, Fitz Lee's skirmishers came galloping back with word that federal cavalry were hot on their heels. Lee immediately sent a dispatch to his uncle requesting reinforcements. Thomas Klingman's North Carolina infantry troops were only a few miles on the other side of Cold Harbor. He soon receives word to march his troops to the crossroads as quickly as possible. But back here in the crossroads, the battle has begun. The lead federal brigade has engaged, commanded by Wesley Merritt. They will attack along the Cold Harbor Road. But Lunsford Lomax's troopers are dismounted, fighting as infantry behind defensive works with horse artillery and support. The federal attack is stopped in its tracks. The same thing happens over on the Confederate right as Thomas Devin, leading his brigade up along Black Creek Church Road, meets with the same problem with defenses across the road, and that attack is stopped in its tracks as well. Soon, the infantry troops of Thomas Klingman come marching through the hamlet and they'll swing into line to the left of Lunsford Lomax's troopers north along the Beulah Church Road. So now there's almost an, an unbroken defensive line guarding the approaches to the crossroads. But the federal attacks continue. Now all three federal brigades are engaged. Throughout the waning hours of the afternoon of May 31st, 1864, attack after attack after attack of federal cavalry will meet with failure, slamming into the Confederate defenses only to be stopped and hurled back. The Confederates defending the crossroads are proving that they are going to be stubborn today. But Union General Torbett understands the importance of occupying the crossroads. And he's a cagey enough old soldier to know that there's more than one way to skin a cat. He devises a secondary plan, a flank attack, to hit the Confederates on their left, now being occupied by Thomas Klingman's troops. And if that attack can cause confusion, if it can cause the line to buckle, or at the very least, if it can draw Confederate attention over to the left, then perhaps the main body of Union troops in the center can mount a heavy enough charge to break through the Confederate defenses. It was worth a try, as nothing else had been working that afternoon, and darkness would be coming on soon. Leading the flank attack would be Wesley Merritt. Riding with him would be his regulars, troopers from the 1st and 2nd United States Cavalry, along with Custer's 5th Michigan. They'd soon find out whether or not this flank attack was worth the gamble. It turns out, it was. The flank attack worked like a charm. With the main Union body keeping Confederate heads down in the center, the flank attack swept in from the north along the Beulah Church Road and hit Klingman's line squarely in the flank. The attack did cause confusion. It did cause that line to buckle, and some of Klingman's troops began to fall back. That spreads over to Lunsford Lomax's troopers, and some of them begin to fall back from the line, leading their horses away from the crossroads. 
This is exactly what the doctor ordered, exactly what Union General Torbert was looking for. Now the Union had to take advantage of this break in the line to exploit this breach. And back here in the center, it would be Custer 6 Michigan who will answer that call and step up to get the thing done. The 6 Michigan will quickly move into a heavy mounted charge with drawn sabers. It's like something right out of a Hollywood movie. But this attack by the 6th Michigan was successful. The Wolverines were able to push through and break the Confederate defenses here in the center. Confederate troops in the center and on the left are now falling back. Troops holding the right flank have no choice but to fall back as well. And soon the Confederates have vacated the crossroads, falling back about one mile to the west along the old Cold Harbor Road before turning and establishing a new defensive line. But as the evening shadows begin to creep in, the crossroads of Old Cold Harbor are now the legitimate property of the U.S. Cavalry. But there's good news for the Confederates. The remaining regiments of Robert Hoke's division have now arrived. Robert E. Lee wanted to mount an immediate counterattack to take back the crossroads before the Federal Cavalry had a chance to get a good toehold in. But Lee's troops are exhausted. His cavalry have been fighting for hours, his infantry have been marching in the heat, and they simply lack the strength. The counterattack he planned would have to wait until the early morning hours of June the 1st. But Lee has hedged his bets. Now fully convinced that Grant intends to attack Richmond by way of Cold Harbor, during the afternoon of the 31st, Lee sent a galloper up to the Totopotomoy Creek lines with word for Major General Richard Anderson, now commanding the Confederate First Corps. Orders for that gentleman to bring his corps to Cold Harbor with all dispatch. So for the Confederates, help is on the way. Back here in the crossroads, Federal Cavalry are likewise exhausted. It's been a long day. Hard fought, hard won battle. But for them, help is on the way as well. The big question, would that help arrive in time to fend off a Confederate counterattack? After receiving conflicting orders, Baldy Smith's 18th Corps is finally pointed in the right direction, finally on the road and making tracks for Cold Harbor but it's gonna be a long haul and many miles to go for these guys. In the early morning hours of June the 1st, orders go out to the Union 6th Corps, now under the command of Horatio Wright, orders to likewise come to Cold Harbor. But it is going to be a grueling, all night, 15 mile march over unfamiliar roads. One soldier of the 6th Corps would write, we're gonna have another one of those killing night marches out of a country worse than the wilderness, if that's possible. So infantry support is on the way for the Federal Cavalry, but as the hours tick by, it becomes pretty apparent that support will not arrive in time. The U.S. Cavalry here in the crossroads are on their own after all. But now the question is this, can they hold? I'm standing in a large farm field bordered by trees about half a mile from the old Cold Harbor crossroads. So far, Union Cavalry Commander Phil Sheridan had received no orders from his commanding officer. To him, Torbert's troops were just sitting ducks, waiting to be slaughtered by a heavy counterattack. So, during the night, he sent orders to vacate the crossroads. No sooner had the evacuation been executed, Sheridan received orders from George Meade, orders to hold the crossroads at all costs. Sheridan countermanded his earlier orders and sent Torbert's troops trotting back to the crossroads. Luckily for them, they got back before the Confederates even knew they were gone. Now it was time to set up the defense. The crossroads would be defended by Thomas Devon with help from David Gregg's division. To their right, along the road north, stretching all the way to Beulah Church, about half a mile were the brigades of Merritt and Custer, and there would be an artillery support. Just before dawn on June 1st, the leading division of the Confederate First Corps arrived at Cold Harbor, commanded by South Carolina's Joseph Kershaw. Kershaw swung his regiments around to the left of Robert Hoke's division. He quickly moved his troops out to the east towards Beulah Church, which is across the road from where I'm standing today, on a reconnaissance in force, with the understanding that Hoke's division would likewise move forward in tandem. But there was a breakdown in communication, which resulted in Hoke's men staying put, and only Kershaw's men make the reconnaissance. Spearheading Kershaw's division was a brigade of South Carolina infantry, still known in the Army as Kershaw's Brigade, as the general had commanded these troops for quite some time before being elevated to divisional command. Having only arrived with the Army the day before with his 20th South Carolina infantry, Colonel Lawrence Kitt, a senior officer, would be placed in command of the brigade. Kitt was no soldier, but a politician and a famous one. 
Known in South Carolina as a fire eater, Kit was a staunch supporter of slavery and secession. But he was better versed in the art of politics than in the art of war. He'd never commanded a body of troops as large as a brigade in the field before. His inexperience would quickly become apparent. Kit led his brigade out of the woods and into the open field I'm standing in, bordering the Beulah Church Road and near a large portion of the federal defense line. In his inexperience, he massed his regiments and marched them to the right, back towards the crossroads, in this open field, basically parading before the federal defense line. And that line was formidable. Along with artillery support, about 12 guns, Custer's Michigan troops and at least one regiment of Merritt's brigade were armed with a new weapon, the seven-shot Spencer repeating carbine. This weapon gave the Union cavalry an enormous superiority in firepower, to which they used in full effect, sending volley after volley of deadly, accurate fire into the ranks of Kitt's brigade. Although their casualties were slight, the Federal line was heavy enough to send Kit's men to the ground, scrambling for cover. Kit himself would be hit and knocked out of the saddle. He was mortally wounded and died from his wounds the following day. A second Confederate attack formed but was met with the same fate, halted by the heavy Union fire. By 8.45 a.m., the Confederate counterattack was over. Kershaw called a halt and reformed his troops along the new Confederate line where they began to dig in with whatever they had handy, tin cups, plates, bayonets. With a numerical superiority, the Confederates had a chance to overwhelm a smaller, isolated Federal Cavalry Division before their reinforcements could arrive. For them, however, the chance was lost. Through most of the month of May, the Union Cavalry had defeated its southern counterparts. Now, at the crossroads, Phil Sheridan's troopers could boast that they had defeated Confederate infantry as well. Grant's optimism was through the roof at this point. He'd been pleased with the performance of his army throughout the entire campaign. And now, with the success of his U.S. cavalry, Grant believed the Army of Northern Virginia was on its last legs. He decided to mass his forces together and attack Lee's troops. The battle for Cold Harbor would now be in full swing. <laughs>